Okay, welcome everyone to our first Dean's Lecture of the year, and it's my pleasure to welcome Christopher Crow from the University of Pennsylvania, and he will be talking about uh, geometric rigidity problems. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be in Binghamton. It's the first time I've been here, and it's not so far from Philadelphia. It's, it's closer than I thought. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, geometric rigidity problems, which is sort of the rigidity part of geometric inverse problems, but I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. So to begin with, I want to talk about the boundary rigidity problem. So the, the setup is we'll have a manifold M, n-dimensional, with a boundary and a Riemannian metric. So it's a compact <coughs> Riemannian manifold with boundary N. So it's a manifold with boundary, and at each point you have an inner product between any two tangent vectors. You know what the inner product is. You have lengths of curves, and you have angles between curves. Okay. So uh, given such a thing for a pair of points on the boundary, so, it's, so D sub G is going to be a map from boundary cross boundary into the positive reals, which is the chordal distance. That is. <coughs> The two points are on the boundary, and you look at paths gamma running from P to Q, and you look at the infimum of the lengths of such paths. So that's the distance through the inside, as opposed to the distance around the boundary, which would be a different answer. That's, so we're looking at the chordal distance. And here's the problem. The boundary rigidity problem is, can you recover the Riemannian metric on the inside if you know the distances between boundary points. Is that enough information? Or, or I ask the question, does DG determine G? Being able to recover is kind of a different question. So there are potential applications. I'll say potential and leave that you know, sort of big. Because if you talk to anybody who's really applied, they'll tell you trying to actually invert this question involves very ill, po Ill matrices that have, you know, lo big, large matrices with lots of entries that are near zero, eigenvalues near zero. So it's not necessarily a great, uh, the potential is maybe not as great as it at first sounds. But nonetheless, there is potential application to seismology and medical <laughs> imaging uh, in the sense of if you, for instance, you use a CAT scan, you use x-rays. And x-rays, they go straight through, and you measure how much of the x-ray was absorbed. But it's a linear problem. You know exactly the path taken. If instead you use sound waves or lower energy particles, you don't know the path. All you maybe can measure is how long it takes to get to the other side. But since you're using lower energy things, you won't fry somebody's brain by, by sending, by taking more measurements. So the trade-off is maybe by taking more measurements, uh, you can get a better answer. But the first question is, do we even have enough information? Even if we knew, so for, I'm a geometer, I'm coming in from the geometric point of view. If you know all of the distances, does that uniquely determine the metric? That's the, uh, and there are all their inverse. Oh, so, no, you also have to know the diffeomorphism type of M, presumably, right? No, not necessarily. So you, you, could, you, could, you want to maybe want to extract that. So you're asking not only does it determine the Riemannian metric, but also does it determine the manifold? Correct. You can ask both questions. I mean, both are reasonable questions. And, and in general, the answer is false, by the way. I'll give counterexamples in a second, so maybe you're leading in that direction. But you can ask the question about manifolds as well. And you'll see some examples of inverse problems where the topology changes. So, so both parts are relevant. So now I'm going to ignore applications and, and stick to the ge geometric question. But so one way, to, of course, if, if you start with a diffeomorphism from your manifold mm -hmm. that leaves the identity fixed, and you pull your metric back by that diffeomorphism, you get an isometric metric, and it's just a it's sort of a reparameterization. But that's one thing that, that always happens. Uh, and what I want to ask is if that's the only thing that can happen. So the definition 
a manifold is called boundary rigid if these are the only such metrics that have the same boundary distance function, the pullback metrics. So just isometric metrics, in, in another way of saying it. So you get uniqueness from the boundary distance function. And the first thing is examples of non, uh, non-rigid manifolds. So if you look at this manifold, this is a surface in, in Euclidean in three space, say, the distance between boundary points involves curves that never go up into this top part. So you can do anything you want up here. Change the metric, <coughs> put extra holes in it, change the topology, and you'll never see any distance change down here. So this guy's clearly not boundary rigid. The second example is kind of right on the edge of being boundary rigid, as it turns out, and that is a hemisphere. So one of the things you can do for the hemisphere is multiply the metric by a function that's bigger than one everywhere, but dead one on the boundary. Everywhere else it's bigger than one. Well, the distance between boundary points for a hemisphere, the shortest path, will run along, along the boundary to begin with, and you haven't changed that. So all your distances here don't change, but the metric has changed. You can make it have bigger volume. Now, as it turns out, it, it turns out this is an edge case. If you pull it in just slightly, if you look at a spherical cap that's a little smaller than the hemisphere, that will be boundary rigid, it turns out. But, but hemispheres are not. So that means we have to describe a class of, I'm going to make a conjecture, a, the class of metrics that might possibly be boundary rigid for us to talk about. And the first uh, class are the simple ones. So it's simple if the boundary is strictly convex, second fundamental, if you know what I mean, second fundamental forms all have positive writing values. Uh, and for every p, the exponential map is a diffeomorphism from its domain. So what do I mean? Like the exponential map Right, is, is shooting out geodesics from the boundary. And I want to say that you stand at your boundary point, you shoot your geodesics out, that that map will give you diffeomorphism. So everybody's one-to-one -one all the way to the end. So that's what simple means. And the first thing I should say is simple, first of all, means you're a ball. So, so the topology is, if in the simple case, we're talking about balls, topological balls it's con with convex boundaries and all the GD6 are minimizing all the way across. So that's one possible category. Uh, and I would say conjecturally, all simple guys are boundary rigid. It's not proven by any stretch. But conjecturally, that would be true. Now, I guess since I'm going to use this term later on in the process, there's another condition called SGM, which stands for strong geodesic minimizing. And this, uh, this will apply to every subdomain of Euclidean space. And all it means is every geodesic minimizes until it hits the boundary again. And it's a unique minimizing geodesic that, that does that. So strong geodesic minimizing is actually a, the term. I, I don't want to give it the, a precise definition, but what I said was approximately correct. So in particular, it includes every subdomain of Euclidean space. Could you say it just once again? Uh, it's OK. So this is an approximate definition. That for every geodesic in the interior, it is the shortest path all the way to between its endpoints. And it's the unique shortest path. And also, it's not allowed to have a conjugate point at the end, if you know what that means. So it's, it's slightly more general than than simple. That's quite a bit more general than simple because now you're going to have topology. But in particular, it includes every <coughs> n-dimensional subdomain of Rn with boundary it is, is in that category of SGM. Uh, I mentioned this already. OK. So before going on, I'll give you the easy question that if you can solve it, answers all these questions. So this, this really is kind of at the heart. 
So your metric, your original metric G, is a ball, a Riemannian ball of radius r about a point x. That is, the boundary is the set of points at distance exactly r from the center. And assume anything else you like about this ball. Its boundary is convex. The, of course, the more you assume, the less you'll get out as a theorem in the end. But let's say it's simple. It's a simple ball. Now you take another one with the same boundary distance function. Is there a point in there whose distance is r from the boundary? That turns out to be really, every point over here has distance less than or equal to r to the boundary. That's easy. To see there's actually a point in there whose distance is equal to r turns out to be a crucial, nobody ever works at it from this point of view. I just, giving you a, a seeming easy sounding problem, which is actually quite hard. Nobody knows the answer in general. The only time I've ever seen anyone prove that is to prove this is isometric to that. And then, of course, it has somebody in the center. But, all right. So that's the problem. And now let's start with some history. So the history, at least that I have, goes back to 1905 with these three applied dudes, Kurt Watts, Whitechurch, and Zo Spritz, and I probably pronounced one of them wrong, uh, or not more than one of them wrong. So they considered, but the, the real question was, that they were asking is, can we determine the density of the Earth by taking measurements of how, how long sound travels, how long it takes sound to travel from one point on the Earth to another? So you listen to seismic events, and you figure how long it takes for that sound waves to travel to the inside of the Earth. So they were thinking of a sim simplified problem. You wanted a three ball. You looked at radially symmetric metrics. Uh, and not, they were not only radially symmetric, they're isotropic, meaning it's, it's a, the metric was a function times the flat metric. And could you reconstruct that function from that data? And this, this problem is, they call the inverse kinematic problem of seismology. That's a nice sounding name. But the, the question is, can you reconstruct the Earth? And they proved that, yes, you can. You, for, for the radially symmetric isotropic metrics, you can, in fact, reconstruct it. Uh, there's a big jump, but the next uh, thing I see uh, is by Romanoff in 19... Uh, 67, and he looked at this problem for, but not isotropic anymore, and you looked at the linearized problem near the radial symmetric. So here, he, uh, sorry, he was still doing the isotropic problem. But here you're looking at radial symmetric isotropic, and he linearized the problem near the radial symmetric case. And it, it amounts to a question of can you determine a function on a radially symmetric simple ball from its integrals along geodesics. That's what it amounts to. And he proved that, yes, indeed, you can do that. Uh, conformal case. So, so now we're looking at isotropic metrics in general. In the case of simple metrics, Mohamedov in 1975 uh, proved it in two dimensions, and then he also proved in 1982 all dimensions that, in fact, you can. For simple metrics, if you're looking at a, so one metric is simple, and the other metric is just a functional multiple of that simple metric, then you can recover it. And then I, in 91, I did that for the SGM case, the stronger one. Uh, and let's see, 82, uh, compact subdomains of the plane. Any compact subdomain of the plane is boundary rigid. Uh, any compact subdomain of hyperbolic plane is boundary rigid. Or in all dimensions, any compact subset of an open round hemisphere. So this is what I was talking about before when I said all of the spherical caps are boundary rigid. Well, in general, any subdomain of a hemisphere, but it's compact subdomain of the open hemisphere, so you don't get down to the edge. Those guys are boundary rigid. Uh, then Gromov, 
um, prove that any compact subdomain of Rn is family rich. So maybe I'll stop and restate that. So, so you take any subdomain of Rn and you try to look at any other manifold that has distances between the boundary points the same as that subdomain of Rn, then it in fact is isometric to that subdomain of Rn. So this was uh, in one of the zillion results in filling Riemannian manifolds, which is a great uh, paper by Bromov. Uh, and I have these little red things that I didn't say anything about. So by the end of the talk, if I have time, and I think I will, I'll say a little bit about how you argue these kind of things. And there are two arguments that show up a lot. One's a conjugacy argument, and the other is a filling volume argument. And that's why they're here, just to tell you. Later, I'll tell you how you, what the arguments look like, how you prove something. Uh, then in uh, 1990, uh, Latal and Independent and myself to prove that for two-dimensional SGM manifolds, if the curvature is negative, then it's boundary rigid. <coughs> I'm almost done. Besson Couture alone. And didn't know they did this, but in 1995, they showed that compact subdomains of negatively curved symmetric spaces are boundary rigid. So we're getting close to the end of what we know about this. We do know something more recent, this, this millennia. Pestov and Oldman proved in 2003 the two-dimensional simple case. That is, you take a, a surface, if all, ge all geodesics are minimizing and has convex boundary, then it's boundary rigid, no curvature assumption needed. And then Barago and Ivanov sort of built on Bromov's method. I mean, it's a substantial build. <laughs> it's a major work in the subject. They proved that any if you start with a, a domain, a, a manifold with boundary, which is close in a C3 sense or something, to a flat guy, then it's boundary rigid. And, and by, by that I mean the other manifold you're comparing it to has no assumption on it, just has the same boundary distance function. It doesn't have to be close to flat. But the, but the one you started with is close to flat, then flat, close to a flat, simple thing, then it's boundary rigid. And they also did it for things close to hyperbolic in space. So those two different papers. What, what do you mean by close enough? Yeah, I didn't define that. So it's so C3. It's just the C3 argument. I mean, if you read the proof, you, you can see exactly what the definition is. But I, I'm not going to try and give you that definition. It comes out of the proof. Right. They show, yeah, you can modify, you can vary a little bit here and there. So there is a three, one statement is true. <laughs> Given a, a compact domain in, in Rn, there exists a C3 neighborhood such that anything in that C3 neighborhood uh, is boundary rigid. But it's really more general than that. They, they don't just say there exists a C3 neighborhood. They, the proof gives you some description of the three C3 neighborhood. The, the statement I made is an existence statement. They actually do better, but they don't state it in a way that's easy to see. At least not for me. All right, so that, that, that was a history that I want to, uh, I think of the, but this is, there have been a lot of important results that I haven't mentioned. This problem can be linearized. You, 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 uh, there are results that are local. There are results that are generic. And there are, in particular, instead of looking at geodesic flows, you can look at magnetic <coughs> flows or results about that. But I'm not really, a, I could spend the rest of the time talking about all of these various results. And I just want to mention some of the major contributors that I didn't mention in the earlier part, but go on the other subject. Now I want to talk about what I'm interested in these days. Well, no, I don't want to do that yet. <laughs> so I want to talk about if you're given, 
uh, and manifold with, bound, uh, with boundary and a Riemannian metric, uh, what do, can you tell from DG right away? And the first thing you can tell is what the Riemannian metric is when restricted to the boundary. And that's simply because uh, for any curve, you know, this curve is supposed to lie on the boundary. For any curve on the boundary, you can look at, break it up into tiny little pieces, and, and you know the distance in, inside between those two pieces. And you take the limit as you go to zero, you compute the curve, the length of that curve on the boundary from the chordal distances. And so therefore, you can reconstruct the Riemannian metric. So if you know the, the distances between points, chordal distances, you also know the Riemannian metric on the map. Um, and uh, of course, I'm doing this in the, in the, the SGM case. Or simple, let's stick to simple. Now the next thing that you can tell is, uh, is how GD6 come out of your, your surface. So let me start. You have a point P. And you have a fix uh, on the boundary. And you let V be the, the gradient at Q of the distance function from P. So the, that, that is going to be the unit vector at Q, which is tangent to the, this unique, because we're in the SGM case or, or minimi, uh, simple case, there will be exactly one geodesic from P to Q, and it will have the length. And the derivative of the distance function, the gradient, is just the, the tangent vector, unit tangent vector to that guy. So that's what V is. But on the other hand, W, which is the gradient of DG, that is this distance function restricted to the boundary, it's just a normal projection of V to, to the tangent space. So the point is, you're given dg. So if you know dg, you know w. But if you know w, the red arrow, v, is the unique unit vector which projects down onto v, on, onto w. So w you know, and therefore there's a, only one unit vector that's going to project down, so you know v. So that means knowing this boundary distance function tells you that you know the output vector from the geodesic that starts at P and goes to Q. And, one, and of course, you can reverse it. You know the, the output direction starting at Q looking at P. You know this output direction. So that information comes from the distance function. So in particular, you're going to know what I call the scattering data. So let me define scattering data. So again, we're going to be considering compact manifolds with boundary. And if, if you start at P uh, at the boundary and you look at a vector pointing inward, then C, can barely see that, but there is one C, is the geodesic that, that goes in the V direction. There's a unique geodesic heading in that direction. And it's going to come out. Well, it might come out. I didn't assume anything about simple gaps. But, but in, in general, it might come out somewhere when it first hits the boundary again. And this map, so the scattering data of a Riemannian manifold with boundary is this map that takes V to W. So I think of it as geodesic lens stuff. You, you set a light ray in, it comes out, and you know how it's coming out. That's the data, that's the scattering data. And so I just, the thing I said before showed that if you know the boundary distance function, then one thing you know is the scattering data on simple manifolds anyway. So the scattering data is uh, is this information about in, in input vectors and the output vectors. And the lens data also includes the length or the travel time of the geodesic. So if you were, 
thinking of these as light rays, knowing the lens data is also knowing how long it took the light to get to come out. The scattering just gives is just the vector. And part of what I'm going to be talking about today is the difference between knowing the lens data and knowing the, uh, the scattering data. That's one of the things. Can you say? Is that all right? So, so lens is scattering <coughs> and the lens. Right. So lens data is scattering plus length. Uh, the terminology is historic. I mean, I, I don't know why. The, could have called the other one plans, but this is. Uh, Did you say that that if you know the the metric on the the D on the boundary, then you know the scaling there? Did you say that? If you know D G, D G yes. is distance between pair of boundary points. Yes. yes. If you know that and it's simple, or S G M, then in fact you know the scattering data. And the lens data for that matter. You know both because you know distances too given distances. So in the SGM or in the simple case, boundary distance, knowing boundary distance function implies you know the scattering and the lens depth. So now I'm going to state the, the corresponding rigidity to uh, the, the boundary rigidity. So you can have scattering or lens rigidity. So Another, of course, on the other hand, with scattering, you don't have to look at simple, right? The, the scattering, the geodesics go in and, and they may see all of the manifold and come out again. So you're maybe getting in much more information from the scattering data if you're not in the simple case than from the boundary data. So it's sort of a, they play different roles. Uh, so another manifold is set down the same scattering data. If there's an isometry between the boundaries, uh, with respect to that isometry, they have the same scattering or lens data. So, right? so there's a if you have an isometry between the boundaries, incoming vectors, you know what corresponding ones are. They're the guys who project to the same vectors on the boundary. So it's easy, given this vector, you know what a corresponding vector is here. And if you see where V comes out, you're supposed to come out of the corresponding place in the corresponding direction. So that's having the same scattering, and of course lens means the same lens. So we'll call a manifold M del M G scattering rigid, or lens rigid, if for every such other manifold with the same scattering data, the isometry on the boundary extends to an isometry of the whole manifold. So that's, so we want to look at guys that are lens or scattering rigid as well as boundary rigid. So there are three different interrelated uh, stories. Uh, so in general, we're going to have to worry about trap geodesic. So a trap geodesic in your manifold, basically a geodesic doesn't get out. So it's a geodesic such that there's an in unbounded time interval where gamma stays in the interior. They could be like a closed geodesic in the interior that never touches the boundary on either end, or sometimes you have, you go in, but you stay inside forever and never come out. That's also uh, uh, trapped. And, and in that case, and the, the scattering data of V will, is just undefined. It doesn't come out. It doesn't come out. So I'm going to say a little bit, first of all, about the difference between lens and scattering. So if you know uh, about, about the scattering data, and you have a geodesic here, and here's another geodesic, you want to consider this length. You can, if you take a one parameter family of geodesics from here to there, then the derivative of the length is just determined via the first variation formula from the angle that the variation makes with the tangent vectors here. So the same scattering data, somebody else has the same scattering data, the same 
one parameter family or corresponding one parameter family will have the same derivative. So that, that if the lengths of one of them is, is right, then the lengths of the other one will be right. So a lot of the information about the lens data is already in the scattering data, but not all. So in particular, if the metric is simple, then you can get from any geodesic to any other geodesic by such a, a one parameter family. Uh, then the scattering data determines the lens data up to a constant. But the constant need not be zero. Yes. Or maybe. It's not clear that constant is zero. But we'll come back to that. But in the non-simple case, here's a counterexample to thinking the scattering data might always determine the lens data. So first let me tell you what these two pictures are. This here, that's supposed to be a, a sphere that's cut off and just glued onto this base. Over here, you take the hemisphere, the upper hemisphere, you chop it off, and you identify the typical points. So now here's some place where you're changing the topology. So they have different topologies. Now the first claim is that these guys have the same scattering data but different lens data. And you can see down here, the geodesics, if you have a geodesic just goes across, then the corresponding geodesic here has exactly the same length. So, so far the lengths are the same, but, it come, but they look exactly the same, they come out the same. There's this geodesic right in here, this neck geodesic, if you start there are, there's a geodesic that, that spirals into that neck that's infinitely long. So there's a trapped geodesic starting at every point. And that's kind of the edge. Up until you hit that guy, the lengths are the same. On the, once you get a little bit more heading more normal to the, then you come out into the hemisphere part, and a geodesic will be a great circle coming to the out, to the other end. And then it will go out. Well, this one will, will just jump to the other end and go out. So the, the in the picture, if you drew one of these geodesics, this would have that extra great circle part. And this one doesn't. So the lengths, all of these guys, by the way, they'll come out the same way. Sorry, come out the same way. It, but so the scattering will be the same, but the lens will differ by well if that was a unit sphere or differ by pi. So this shows you that you know some geodesics can have the same, given the same scattering data, some can have the same lengths, and others can differ, but they differ by a constant. And the, here the place that divides them is where there's a trap geodesic. Now, at the moment, I don't know any counterexample to scattering data implying the lens data in the when there isn't a trap geodesic. So one might conjecture that. There's no proof seen. Um, so, of course, as I say, this example has trap geodesics. And there are no known examples without trap geodesics. However, so here there's a counterexample. It's called the invisible Eaton lens. So by the way, having non-uniqueness for scattering data is inventing a uh, invisibility cloak. Right? If you think about it uh, geometrically, not not sort of the materials way that people are building it, that means that geodesic rays going in light rays going in come out just as if in the two different spaces the same way. So if you could do it for Euclidean space, then you'd have an invisibility cloak. Of course, Gromov pretty much proved you can't exactly, but you can almost, and in the invisible Eaton lens is an example, it's a surface of revolution. It does have a singularity, 
but to the scattering rigidity of the flat unit disk. So the flat unit disks, in fact, are scattering rigid. Sorry. That's a theorem I'm going to mention in a second by one of my students. But it was not known to be until because this uh, the, the flat, sorry, the invisible Eaton lens is a surface of revolution with the singularity of the center. And geodesics come in, make a si single circuit, and go out just as if they were going straight. And they have an extra 2 pi of length. And the boundary is a geodesic of length 2 pi. They, they kind of, you know, look like this, and they come up to a, to a point. I didn't write down the formula, but you can write down the formula. Uh, the, the, the fact that the invisibility is the fact that you make it go all the way around and look just like Euclidean. If you wanted to go part of the way around and come out in a different direction, you could do that too. But if you make it go exactly once around, it's invisible. You can also make it go twice around. But, 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 so this problem says that the scattering data, uh, almost a counterexample to the scattering data of the two-dimensional flat disk, not giving rise to the same lens data. So uh, my student, Haomin Wen, proved that uh, simple surfaces are, in fact, scattering rigid. So let me say that what he proved were simple. Remember, this is convex, two-dimensional, convex boundary. It's a ball. Uh, includes the flat disk. He proved that, in fact, you can, if you don't allow a singularity, then, in fact, the Scattering data does determine the lens data, and then the the, the rigidity part is is uh, passed off. Ullmann had already proved that simple simple uh, two dimensional manifolds are boundary rigid. So once you know the lens data, you know the boundary data. So he had to kind of say this kind of phenomenon that happens with a singularity doesn't <coughs> happen without a singularity. Okay, then this was uh, let's see, this last summer with Helmin. He showed that uh, for the SGM case and generic, I'll tell you what generic is if you want to hear. It has to do with the boundary. Th this is probably something that should be scratched at some point in the future. But manifolds with boundary can have pretty nasty boundaries. That is, you can change curvature from inside to outside. You have what are called. But the point where the curvature switches from convex to concave, you can have infinitely many of those. And they can form a canter set. They can be pretty nasty. We we didn't. We just did the case where there are finitely many switch points. But in the finitely many case, we showed that if uh, I mean it's a totally different proof than before, but it's true that if you have the same scattering data, then you have the same lens data. But it's very two-dimensional. We still don't know anything about, say, the three-ball, flat three-ball. We don't know if the scattering data determines the lens data for that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, in this talk, is there any restriction on dimension, or is it all about low dimension? Or well, You haven't mentioned dimension. The, the thing about dimension, so I say surface a lot. Surface means two-dimensional. Yeah, and true. the reason I... The, the, what happens is the theorems tend to be in, in two dimensions, and the questions tend to be in higher dimensions. So most of what I'm saying is about all dimensions, but when I get down to talking about theorems, you'll also often see the two dimensions. So in particular, what I sent back here, how men, simple surfaces, two dimension. Uh, and this scattering is about surfaces. but. The question is in the n dimensions. And in particular, if you're looking, talking about applications, three dimensions is pretty important if you're trying to do human skulls or the Earth or something. Three dimensions would be nice to know about, but we don't know. 
So at the moment, even whether a lens implies, a scattering implies lens for the flat three ball is not answered. It's an open question. I'll have some other easy sounding open questions for you before long, but that's one. And that might not even be too hard, I don't know. So, you know, in some sense, people haven't been looking at this too long because they kind of always thought that you could handle it until they start looking at the invisible Eaton lens and all of a sudden it's, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's not so easy. And so then there's been a little bit of work being done. But it's only a few years old. And as I say, there's no, the, the, the canonical open question is the three ball. Can you get the lens data from the scattering data? Oh, there it is. It's up there. <laughs> it's unknown, even if flat balls in dimension larger than two are scattering. Rigid, they are boundary rigid. Flat balls, that was Gromov. Flat balls are boundary rigid, but we don't know if they're scattering. There's really only one other scattering rigidity result I know of. That is, you, you don't know the distances, you just know the scattering data. <coughs> and that's the following. If n is bigger than or equal to 2, then the flat product metric on dn cross s1. So you start, this is a question, by the way, Gunter Ullman asked me. Start with a flat 2 disk, cross it with s1. Is it boundary rigid? Is it scattering rigid? Is it lens rigid? And the answer is that it is, in fact, scattering rigid, which is kind of the strongest, where this is n bigger than equal to 2. So you take an n ball and cross it with s1. Um, this, this has a property that, that uh, it has a trap GD6. So a lot of the techniques other techniques don't work, Frank. If you, well, I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is a separate talk that I give. But if you have a another manifold with the same lens data or scattering data, say, the real one of the main issues there is the measure of the set of trapped geodesics might not be zero. Over here, the measure is zero, but you don't know about the measure of the trapped geodesics in the other space. And so the main technical thing to prove is that the measure of the trap GD6 is zero in the other space. And then there are techniques for getting at this. And th th there's a more general statement than this, but I'm not, not going to bother trying to say it. Uh, but this it turned out that you could do this one case. Notice n being n equal to 2. I don't have n equal to 1. So n equal to 1 is maybe the simplest manifold that I don't know whether it's scattering rigid or not. You might think about the three ball, that I had, but you can take an interval cross S1, your nice flat cylinder. I do not know if that is scattering rigid or not. Or if the lens, if the scattering data, oh, let, me, let me go on a little bit. So I'll come back to that in a second. That's still open. But here's an example is the flat Mobius strip. The flat Mobius strip is not scattering rigid. And here's a counterexample. It looks very much like the counterexample I showed you before. This is, uh, I only have a C1 metric, but that's good enough. I'm just, just type of problem. So here you take your cylinder and you identify antipodal points. And here you take your cylinder and you throw on a hemisphere on the top. And for the same reason as before, they have the same scattering data. So this original manifold is not scattering rigid. And this kind of gives you pause about the cylinder itself, although I don't know. But there is a theorem. This is another student of mine, uh, We showed that the flat product metric on the cylinder is lens rigid where i is the interval. So this is the one I said, I don't know if it's scattering rigid, but it is, in fact, lens rigid. And the flat Mobius strip turns out to be lens rigid, although it's not scattering rigid. So if you know the lengths, then, in fact, you can recover the, the, the metric that's so flat. And then there's one other in that paper that, that if you have a negatively curved metric on a cylinder, 
with convex boundaries. So you think, think about this kind of opening up cylinder. That'll have a convex boundary. That that's also lens rigid, not scattering, <laughs> but lens rigid. And all of these, I'd say it's unknown, except we do know about the Mobius strip isn't scattering rigid. But I don't know about this metric on. It really, it comes down to a question. If you look at the geodesic that goes normal to the surface, it's going to come out normal to the surface. But how long is it? It's some number a. If that a is equal to the same, if the original one had length 1, and you have the same scattering data, does that also have length 1? That would do it. But like you can prove it's bigger than equal to 1, but you can't prove. Oh, maybe you can. I can't prove that it is one. All right. So, so we've proved a bunch of things are lens rigid. Maybe everybody's lens rigid. Right? Lens, remember that was, you know, the scattering data and the lengths. Well, <coughs> certainly you're kind of measuring everywhere in your manifold, unlike boundary rigid. You know, you're shooting geodesics in, they're floating around, they're going everywhere, and then, then they come out. Every point will be sampled by shooting a geodesic that goes through there. So maybe there's enough information that everybody's lens rigid. Of course, I asked it because I know the answer. I don't always know the answers to my questions, but this one I know, <coughs> not at all. So here's a, an interesting, well, I think interesting, counterexample. This is supposed to be a flat cylinder with a bump. And here's a flat cylinder where you slid the bump. And if you look at, this is what, this is surface of revolution. You can use Claro's formula if you like to figure out what geodesics look like. And they're going to come out the same in these two spaces as they went in. And they'll have the same length. So you cannot tell from the, the, the lens data where this bump is. So it's the the, not everybody's lens, lens rigid. Uh, to date, all pairs have had trap geodesics. We don't have any counterexamples for trap geodesics. I don't know. Be, I wouldn't call it a conjecture, but it's a question. If you don't have trap geodesics, maybe your lens rigid. Pretty open. So uh, let's see, all of the examples we saw of boundary rigid, things that were boundary rigid, I mentioned the history of all the boundary rigid stuff, well, there are of course lens regions, so you know that. Because the lens data, you know all the distances, so that's true. Okay, so now I want to <coughs> back, back. But this is not boundary rigid. This, well, if you know the lens data, then you know the, the, the length of all geodesics, which means you know the distance between boundary points, because you improvise so over this geodesics. This is not an example to boundary rigid. Right. So, if you, yeah, so if you know that something is boundary rigid, then it's automatically lens rigid. Because anyone who has the same lens data also has the same boundary distance function. Lens, not scatter. And so if it's lens, if you know the lens data, then you know the lengths of geodesics. So take any two points on the boundary, they got all the geodesics between the two, the shortest one is the distance. So if you know the lens data, you know the boundary distance. So, so that's where, so there are lots of lens rigid guys, but there are all of these boundary rigid guys. And plus the ones I just told you, the recent ones. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit, I don't have too much time, but about, uh, I mentioned these two methods, conjugacy method and uh, filling volume method, for how do you prove those boundary regions. So that's what I'm going to go off now and talk about what this means. So we have, if G is an SGM metric and G1 is lens equivalent to it, then we want to note that there's a conjugacy between the geodesic flows. That is, there's a map, F, which takes a unit vector V, and it gives you a map 
a vector f of v over here. How do you get it? Well, you, you take the g of e z going backwards from v. It has a boundary, dis, a boundary tangent. Take the corresponding boundary tangent, follow the geodesic out, the same distance, and that's f of v, the tangent vector now, it's f of v. It's, it commutes with the geodesic flow, that is if you flow a little bit over here and then take the image, it's the same as taking the image and then flowing, simply because we, the, the way we defined it. Right? It's well defined, because the lengths of geodesics are the same as the corresponding lengths over here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be well-defined. So it's a well-defined map. And it commutes with the geodesic flows. And that's in the SGM case as well. Um, differentially, it's kind of complicated. It's always C0. Uh, it's C infinity almost everywhere. Uh, and in the simple case, it's C, C infinity. I mean, the, the question really, in the SGM case, you have to worry about geodesics tangent here versus geodesics. You know, you have this kind of variation here, and then you suddenly jump. And if you try and make that map to the other space, it's not necessarily going to be C infinity across this jump. So, so I'm not claiming C infinity everywhere, but almost everywhere it's and it's a nice uh, flow. Uh, F in particular doesn't preserve base points. And if you have two vectors at a point, there's no reason why this vector should, should go anywhere near this base point. Right? You have to follow this different geodesic and take the other geodesic in the other space. So, so F won't preserve base point. In fact, part of the goal is to prove that it does. Right? So, if it does preserve base points, then it's covering an isometry. It's a differential of an isometry. That's not hard to do. So in general, it won't do that. But it does preserve the canonical contact flow. I'm not going to go into that. If you know what it is, then it's fine. If you don't, it's OK. So it's a contact amorphism, if you like. Uh, and in particular, it preserves the Liouville volume form, which is consequence. And hence, the volume of the two spaces are the same. So one quick thing you get out of it, which is all I'm trying to get out of this business at the moment, is that the volumes are the same. If they have the same lens data, at least the volumes are the same. So there's a, a question about uh, Conjugacy rigidity for Riemannian manifolds, <laughs> typically with negative curvature. But if M, if you have two compact manifolds that um, compact Riemannian manifolds, and there's a CK contact preserving conjugacy, that is, there's a map from between the unit tangent bundles that commutes with the geodesic flows, time including time. Must they be isometric? That's kind of a pretty big question. Uh, and, uh, but it's not always true. So this is, now let's switch from manifolds with boundaries to manifolds without boundary. I'm going to show you how they get related later. But if you had a manifold without boundary, compact, then you could talk about uh, these uh, conjugacies, time-preserving conjugacies. And one can ask if they're always isometric. And the answer is no. Uh, and the first examples were pointed out by Alan Weinstein. Uh, and they were from Zoll metrics, if you know what Zoll metrics are on surfaces. Uh, so there are examples that are conjugate but not isometric. And then we also gave some examples, uh, Bruce Kleiner and I, to uh, we gave on any Riemannian manifold, it's not, sorry, any manifold, I'm trying to say having counterexamples has nothing to do with topology. So on any manifold, you can put two metrics basically by messing in a compact neighborhood. Uh, two different metrics that are C infinity conjugate but non-isometric. So 
in general, in general, you can't hope for anything that's nice. Uh, that everybody is determined by its. Uh, that any kind you can see implies isometry is not true. So again, you talk, you have a notion of CK conjugacy rigid Riemannian manifolds, and those are manifolds which any other manifold which has a geodesic flow which is CK conjugate to your geodesic flow must be isometric. And the uh, conjecture, it's a pretty big conjecture, is that manifolds of negative curvature are conjugacy rigid. At the very least, if you stick to other, the, the other guy you're looking at is also negatively curved. Maybe that's more the conjecture people are trying to prove. But this is very much open except in two dimensions. Um, but the, the reason I brought it up, it sounds like I've totally changed the subject. But I haven't really. But I won't. Simple subdomains of conjugacy rigid manifolds are boundary rigid. This is one way of finding boundary rigid guys, is start with somebody who's conjugacy rigid. And there are some theorems out there about conjugacy rigidity. And then any subdomain that's simple is boundary rigid by just a simple cut and paste argument. Namely, here's your manifold, which is conjugacy rigid. And you take your simple subdomain, or SGM subdomain, you cut it out, assume that the, you want to prove that it's boundary rigid. Take another manifold that has the same boundary distance function, hence the same lens data. Hence, the, the, you have a conjugacy of the geodesic flows between here and here. Cut this guy out, paste that guy in. Now you get a new manifold, which is conjugate to the old manifold. And the old manifold with conjugacy rigid. So you're isometric to it. So your little piece was isometric to your little piece to begin with. Not much. So this is one way of using conjugacy rigid on the big manifolds to force boundary rigidity on subdomains. And that's some of the ones that I mentioned. The boundary rigidity results I mentioned really came from exactly this. So Michelle's result on subdomains of hemispheres, that comes from the Blaschi conjecture for spheres, which I'm not going to say where it is since I'm almost out of time, which was proven by Roger, Canis, and Yang, and Weinstein, in a series of paper crochet, put the nail in the coffin on that one. Uh, so that's how Michelle got this boundary rigidity for subdomains of hemispheres was based on the Blaschi conjecture. Uh, the one I did, Otal and I, and uh, okay, these are conjugacy results. So these are uh, surfaces, compact surfaces, <coughs> negative curvature, conjugacy rigid, or non positive curvature, C0 conjugacy rigid. Besopertor uh, Galo is an n dimensional result. If you have a negatively curved, locally symmetric space, they showed that C1 conjugacy rigid, and then Ursula Hammonstead proved that you could go to C0. C0 conjugacy rigid. And this is how you got these subdomains I talked about. It's, a, it's an argument, but it's not too much. That subdomains of locally symmetric spaces, which turns into being any subdomain of a symmetric space, is boundary rigid. It really comes from Besson uh, Petrarca and some minor group theory. Uh, and then there's a result with Kleiner manifolds that emit parallel vector fields. Particularly any manifold cross S1, they're always C1 conjugacy rigid. Uh, then you can linearize this whole problem. I guess I mentioned this result in my show for Dinov, extending Gilman and Kastan's idea. It says, you cannot deform a negatively curved manifold without changing its eigenvalue spectrum, eigenvalue of Laplace spectrum. Anyway, it's, it's a, a conjugacy result. Uh, okay. Let me just, uh, since it's a question, I, I, I know it's, I'm running, I think I have a minute or two left. But 
Uh, one can ask the following question, which is a stronger question than boundary rigidity. You have two manifolds, they're SGM, uh, on these two manifolds with boundary. If the distance function on one manifold is bigger than equal to the distance function on the other, does the volume have to be bigger? Seems like a pretty reasonable question. But it's open in general, very open. Uh, and this is the harder part. And if you have equality of volumes, do they have to be isometric? And this, of course, is stronger than the boundary. If the two things are equal, then of course you get this volume bigger than equal to that, and that volume bigger than equal to this. So they have the same volume, and the equality case would imply they're isometric. So this is general, a generalization of the boundary rigidity question uh, in terms of volumes. It's a filling volume question. But that's actually how uh, Barago and Ivanov's proof that I mentioned about simple metrics sufficiently close to Euclidean end space. Those guys do have the property that for any other metric, if that metric has bigger distance functions, then the volume's bigger. That's how they proved it, with equality if and only if isometric. So that they, they proved this question for these surfaces, in some sense. The smaller one is, is close. Uh, there were some results by Ivana. I don't think. I think I probably won't say anything about the uh, all the stuff. I'll put it up. GCG. Uh, let me leave, the, leave you with this question. <laughs> this is the uh, the without boundary version of what I just said about the distance functions being big. There's a the corresponding question is you have two metrics. I take negative curvature if I'm going to pose it. On a compact manifold, if the mark length spectrum What's the Mark length spectrum? For each free homotopy class, there's a unique shortest closed curve in there. It's a unique geodesic in that free homotopy class. The, the function that takes free homotopy class to length is called the marked length spectrum. So this says if ML G1 is bigger than MLS G0, that means the corresponding geodesics in the same top of, uh, free homotopy class it's always longer in the G1 metric than it is in the G0 metric. Is the volume bigger? If the lengths of all the geodesics are big. And if you get equality, is it, does it imply isometric, which is even maybe a weirder question. But uh, it's true in two dimensions. There it is. The answer is yes for any of the two. N dimensions, again, pretty wide open. Anyway, let me end on that. Questions, please? If no questions, let's thank our speaker again.